Well, I thought, I thought in light of uh, the theme of the conference, I would focus uh, during my presentation portion on uh, the discovery of life on Mars, where, we, where we're at after two years now of investigation of what's up there. I know in light of the fact that um, there was a really positive response to my appearance on Coast to Coast on Wednesday, November 11th, that you all might have a lot of questions or um, lingering questions about certain uh, things I might have discussed or didn't discuss uh, with George Norrie on Wednesday. So I'd then like to open it up to questions, of, and I'm expecting a lot probably about Pegasus rather than my Mars material. But I thought that I would uh, just establish the fact that Mars is an inhabited planet, and we now have not just substantial evidence of that, but I think evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. And so I just thought I'd march through and sort of summarize what we found um, I continue to receive data from a growing cadre of research associates around the world now. Uh, there are a number, uh, for example, of photographs of humanoids that have been derived from NASA's photographs and the photographs of the European Space Agency that we haven't even published yet. Just this last week, we found an image of a Martian carving a rock with a handsaw. Okay, so we're not only, we've not only made the linkage between the humanoids that live primarily underground on Mars, and, this, and the overwhelming uh, artwork that we see that litters the entire surface of the red planet, but we have now identified that the humanoids on Mars are in fact the makers of the carved statuary, which is so ubiquitous on the red planet. So I thought I would move rather rapidly through the Mars presentation. We have some time limitations, and then open it up to questions, I, primarily I would assume about Pegasus, but also feel free to entertain any questions uh, entertain any questions you have regarding uh, our, my Mars findings as well. Um, in the first part, we're going to look at the discovery of life on Mars. Um, Mars, as I said, is an inhabited planet. Uh, evidence that Mars harbors several types of human beings, numerous animal species, and elaborately carved statues is contained in several NASA photographs that I analyzed last year, in PIA 10214, and PIA 11049, which are um, essentially westward views and southward views of the Columbia Basin taken from the western edge of the home plate plateau by NASA's rover Spirit in late 2007. They were um, sent back to Earth in early 2008, and I spent many thousands of hours in 2008 analyzing the data and found, as I said in my paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars in 2008, essentially a cosmic treasure trove of images of humanoid beings, animal species, and carved statues uh, on Mars. Uh, a little bit about my background. I was one of America's early time-space explorers, uh, as I described uh, on Wednesday on, on Coast. Officially speaking, for, it, it was from 1969 to 72 that I served in DARPA's Project Pegasus, although the first time I teleported on behalf of the U.S. government was uh, during the 1967-68 time frame, um, and we know that, that that dating is reliable because when we teleported to Santa Fe, my father and I, and then drove uh, over to meet with Dr. Harold M. Agnew when he was then director of the W Division, the weapons division, uh, at the Lo Los Alamos National Labs, there was a discussion uh, between my dad and Dr. Agnew, and um, uh, Dr. Agnew looked over at me and said, how old? And my dad and I answered simultaneously, six. So we know that that meeting with Agnew took place between September of 1967 and September of 1968. I was born in September of 61. And that's also a means that we can use historically to establish that physical teleportation via vortal tunnels propagated by Tesla energetic arrays was already a technical proficiency that had been accomplished by the US Department of Defense by the 1967-68 time frame. Um, officially, I was placed in Pegasus in the fall of 1969 as a third grader and involved primarily in teleporting back and forth between New Jersey and New Mexico and some future locations because, of course, to teleport back, you need, you need team members in the future to send you back to the present. Uh, and also, I described maybe a little bit less on Wednesday the different probes of the future that we, and the past that we took in a, a virtual form of time travel via the chronovisor. So those were the major emphasis of Project Pegasus. Um, I think it was as a result of those experiences that in 1981, I was essentially requested, almost urged, 
by Courtney M. Hunt, who was the CIA agent they placed in my life in the early 80s. You know, throughout June of 81, he was asking me, do you want to go to Mars? And I, I said, quite frankly, no. You know, I didn't really want to leave Mother Earth. Uh, and he said, well, you have to. And I said, why? And he said, because the survival of the human race on Earth depends on it. And I really don't know what he meant by that. He, either he was just speaking of the general proposition that we're going to have to be courageous enough to leave our home planet as astronauts or chrononauts in order to secure our home planet here. Or maybe there was some more elaborate uh, stratagem, stratagem involved that centered on myself. I just simply don't know. He basically told me, well, you know, get ready because you're going. You, don't, you can't really uh, talk us out of it. Uh, and so those two teleportings that took place in July and August of 1981, when I was 19 and uh, going to UCLA here in Los Angeles, were undertaken by um, jump room. They were at a, essentially a CIA facility in El Segundo. We went up via elevator up to the fifth floor, checked in at a kind of a desk there, a counter, a kind of like a Fijian suite that you'd have in a law firm. My name was provided to the one person who was working there. Uh, and then uh, Courtney said, well, Andy, why don't you step in the teleporter? And I said, where is it? You know, I was familiar with the, essentially the elliptical shaped uh, teleporters that had existed at Curtis Wright when I was a child. And he said, we just came up, to the, we just came up here in it. It's the elevator. And so I, I, I walked back in the elevator. The elevator went up to about the eighth floor. And Courtney said a couple times on the intercom, are you ready? And I kept on saying yes, and I was getting ex exasperated with him. And I finally said, light this candle. And uh, then the, essentially, I felt a great deal of pressure. The elevator began to morph into more of a cylindrical shape. And those journeys took about 20 minutes uh, to reach Mars. As a kid, it w we were just jumping in seconds uh, back and forth between uh, New suburban New Jersey and Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is a little bit anachronistic at this point, but I just wanted to point out that my discovery of life on Mars has been the target of a disinformation campaign essentially defaming me and distorting my evidence. Let me just cite one example. They had Ray Villard, who's the news director for the Hubble Space Telescope, I mean he's a NASA employee, um, allege in a 3,000 word hit piece on the Discovery Channel website, which is supposed to embody the highest level of science writing in the world, uh, quote unquote, if Bashago has found evidence of little leprechauns on Mars, why doesn't he show any of them in his writings? Well, that's what my writings have been about. Um, so this presentation is about six months old. I was still sort of wrapped up in the fact that they were spending your tax dollars to, to, to fame me, an independent whistleblower and attorney at law. Um, and I think I've advanced the cause of science by deriving this data from NASA and the ESA's own photographs. Your tax dollars are being spent essentially uh, to defame an independent researcher who has found evidence in NASA's own photographs that Mars is an inhabited planet. Um, now why is this going on? Well, the cover-up uh, of life on Mars is obviously linked to the quantum cover-up because we've been, we've been going there via teleportation since at least 1981. I mean, we may have been going earlier. I was involved in 1981. So when, as brilliant a researcher as David Wilcock states that um, there are now 600,000 U.S. personnel up on the Red Planet, I can't discount that because they, when they sent me up 28 years ago, there were already human beings up there. I mean, on the first teleportation by myself, I was greeted by three young adults who were CIA personnel. They were human beings from our civilization that were already up there. Um, the second time when I went up with, with Courtney Hunt, there was a man that we talked to in a building that was about a half a mile uh, from the skull that I walked out through the eye socket of from the underground location. And he was also a CIA you know, agent, you know, personnel of our civilization here on Earth. And so I think they're very phobic about even discussing the fact that Mars has an indigenous <coughs> ecology and civilization because they don't even want us to think about the fact that there are living humanoids on Mars, both from our own civilization and from the primarily underground civilization that exists on the Red Planet. Several days after I published my paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars, in 2008, actually it was four days later, I was contacted by a career CIA officer. In fact, she's the niece of the man who introduced Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger as friends, a woman by the name of Virginia Olds. And Virginia passed along information from the CIA that the CIA estimates that there are about a million humanoids living in the primarily underground civilization on Mars. So I can't confirm 
Uh, David Wilcox st estimate that it's 600,000 U.S. personnel on Mars, but it certainly is, would, you would presume would be numerous at this point, 30 years after uh, I was set up, uh, set up there as a 19-year-old. Um, in a breakthrough that occurred just several months ago, uh, one of our most gifted ufologists, the great Bob Dean, um, revealed this photograph of presumably a U.S. base on Mars while appearing at the European Exo political summit in Barcelona. Um, I find this kind of interesting because the underground location that they teleported me to was essentially sort of like a concrete bunker, very much like the, um, the rooms that you find one, one level below a baseball stadium. It was basically a, a deep underground military base type construction. And this, to me, uh, somebody with two uh, master's degrees in urban planning looks like it could possibly be a cement uh, organic type of structure that could have been readily poured by uh, human personnel from Earth on another planet. Why am I speaking out? I'm speaking out because I believe that as the natural heritage of humankind, human beings on Earth have a right to the truth about the natural history of the solar system that we inhabit. Now, my, my paper um, I do believe embodies a breakthrough in science. There were 50 discrete discoveries that, are, that were achieved in the paper. I know that it's a significant writing. I'm not boasting. I'm simply saying that this is part of the story because when I was permitted to read my paper in 1971 and also to see the photographs, you know, my dad and the other people involved were very excited. They were sort of preparing me um, relative to the significance of, of the discovery of life on Mars in the same way that they've been preparing our, our presence. It was sort of like, get ready, you're going to be involved in something significant in the future. The paper itself contains highly significant data. Um, it's the first data from Mars to contain images of humans and animals. The beings in the data are captured in their natural living state. Uh, the paper contains the first images of humanoids living in their natural state of existence on another planet. Um, and uh, it also shows the beautiful colors of Mars. Mars is spoken of as the red planet. You, it's difficult to pick up on this uh, projection here, but it's also a place of beautiful um, turquoise colors, pink. Uh, th here's a pewter head of a child that you can see jutting out of a cliff um, right there on the home plate plateau. So it was because of the significance of, uh, of this data in terms of con the paper containing the first images of the ecology and civilization of another planet that I wrote the, uh, the president of the National Geographic Society in December of 2008 asking him to publish my findings in our leading geographic journal in the world, a journal that I've been reading since I was a small boy. And at this point, a year later, almost a year later, I've received no response from the National Geographic Society. Despite the fact that they stated in a special edition published the month before I published my paper that space is the once and future frontier of the human race. Uh, my paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars, analyzes a single photograph. I mentioned that it's PIA 10214. I think it's the most significant photograph that has ever been taken by human beings from Earth because in it we cross the threshold that separates our past as an Earth-bound species from our future as a spacefaring civilization in contact with extraterrestrial species. So it's a very, very significant photograph. Can you see any life forms this far out with this degree of compression of detail? No, and that's why NASA is placing its panorama shots from Mars in such a concentrated way on the Internet because just as if we were to park our car and look out at the San Fernando Valley, we wouldn't be able to make out individual features. The discovery of what this photograph contains had its roots in the public scrutiny that this anomaly um, here attracted beginning in January of 2008 when PIA 10214 uh, was beamed back to Earth and placed on the Internet. It's the apparent form of a human female jutting out from the far left edge of the home plate plateau. Like many uh, Mars anomalous, I wondered, is this a natural rock formation that just uh, emerged spontaneously? Is it, in fact, a statue of a female figure? Is it a fossil of a humanoid being that was fixed in place? Maybe somebody was being chased by a larger creature and was somehow crystallized there in some way? Or what, is it a shot of a living being traversing the cliff? 
I concluded that this is almost without question a statue because it possesses eight characteristics that any art historian or archaeologist would recognize as statuary. First of all, it's standing on a pedestal. It embodies highly articulated human form that nature seldom or even, I, I would say, probably has never uh, produced naturally on Earth. There's duality in the sense that there's two human figures in the same location, which we have never found on Earth as a result of natural forces. The two figures correspond orthographically in the sense that you could put them together as a common statue. One side plugs into the side of the other uh, form. Uh, clearly, gender is present. There's a male and a female figure indicated. They are clothed. They show movement. At least the female figure shows movement. The man seems to be lying prone to her right. Uh, and clearly, there's artistic styling. And also, they have fragmented from what was apparently um, a, a larger statue. So I concluded very early that um, this is a statue on another planet, which in and of itself is, raises, a, as we would say in the law, a rebuttable presumption that there must have been a sculptor, and hence that Mars is inhabited. I was also shocked to find that this statue, which was reproduced in thousands of copies um, on the internet, is standing on a much larger and more disturbing statue. And that is of a large rock carving of a reptile biting the neck of a human being. Now let me just trace that with my hand because people have, been difficult, have had difficulty actually imaging this in their minds. But essentially you've got the female figure standing on a pedestal and then there's a huge statue here of a, of a hairy reptile or snake lunging over and biting the neck of a bearded white male human who's looking forward, sort of a Jesus figure. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. So, this is not just the simple uh, figure of a, f of a female on Mars. It's something much more scary. Here we have the hirsute reptile, the mouth of the reptile, and here you see the eyes and eyebrows of the uh, male human figure. And there's actually pigmentation of some kind that was used to show blood gushing from the neck wound that this animal was inflicting on a bearded uh, white male human on Mars. Now, of course, this could be just a statue. I mean, human beings on Earth make strange statues. It, this could be literally express uh, some sort of metaphysical or historical theme. But it's very disturbing when you also uh, analyze it in concert with the other data that's immediately behind it. Because what I found when I enlarged the entire uh, expanse of the image that essentially choking the ravine beyond the western edge of the home plate plateau is a massive killing field. Now this could be again something innocent because we know from the CIA data that the Martian civilization is primarily underground. It would make sense that they would have large open air cemeteries. This may just simply be their sanitary way of disposing of their dead. But nonetheless we have this very scary uh, image here at a vista point overlooking a huge killing field. And I'm just sharing the data with my fellow human beings because that could be very significant to our interests here on Earth. Here's a larger rendering. You've got the female figure here, the male here. You can even see the area where, where you had the correspondence between his form and hers on the left here. And here's this large form that she's standing on. I hope it's some sort of metaphysical or religious or literary theme rather than something celebrating uh, attacks upon humanoids by reptoid creatures because that's what it in fact shows. Now, why is it difficult to immediately see this? Be well, because NASA is manipulating the scale, the color, and the brightness and contrast of all of its images because as we found, I now, I now have an evolving network of research associates for Mars. We're in Canada, the United Kingdom, Italy, and Australia. The Australians were particularly um, proactive in helping me and affirming my data. Um, they're basically masking so much using these three techniques of manipulating scale, color, and, and the brightness of the images because many of the images are choked with life forms and statues. They're, you know, we're not, in some cases, the images are so full of data that we spend days exploring what's in them. And that's what I did throughout 2008. And I was able to find, for example, life forms like the many plesiosaurs. I'm calling them plesiosaurs, of course. Plesiosaurs were waterborne reptiles before uh, that 
did not survive the KT extinction here on Earth. I'm calling these creatures plesiosaurs basically because they have big bulky bodies and uh, heads and necks like snakes, which plesiosaurs certainly had on Earth. They may be something else. They're certainly possibly land, um, landed plesiosaurs. I also found many statues. Here we have, it's a little bit too dark here with these, this lighting effect and this light overhead, but essentially we have the pointy head of a humanoid with his hands coming out of the earth here. There's actually a Martian sitting in his hands there. That's very that hard light to see. Doesn't work. Yeah, it hurts the eyes. Oh, that one. this one? Your point yeah. is too bright. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll, I won't use that. Sorry. <laughs> is that a pen or? Pen. Oh. <laughs> okay. That'll, that's much, much safer. Is that NASA? <laughs> NASA technology, not, not DARPA. Okay. Oh, thank you. Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. When you need high technology, you want to go to one of our leading exopolitical figures to, <laughs> to get, get your hands on. So, um, so here, here you have something that's very common on Mars. They basically use large statues of, of skulls and so forth to mark um, openings to the underground civilization. In fact, I, I arrived via teleportation in 1981 from an area underground such a skull, you know, behind and, and one floor below such a skull. And then as Courtney Hunt had instructed me, I then walked through the eyes of the statue onto the surface. So that's a, that's a feature of the Martian civilization, apparently. I don't think it's in, in an innovation by us. I think the reason for that, the explanation would, would possibly be that uh, there are still predators that roam the surface of Mars and they need to be able to identify something that a human intelligence can identify to go and find those portals to their underground civilization. Just a surmise on my part, but I think that that's what we may find. Now there are five typologies of humanoids in NASA photograph PIA 10214 that we have thus far identified. The first are human, humanoids with large bulbous heads and spindly bodies, like the gray extraterrestrials that have been cited in the literature of alien-human contact for decades but which I might add whose ultimate origin remains disputed in ufology and is largely ignored by exopolitics. So we've had a lot of discussion that, we're, for example, we're being visited by creatures from distant star systems. We've ignored the notion that we've been visited by creatures from planets near our planet, uh, right in our solar system. We've certainly had very little discussion of the fact that the planet that every two years comes closest to our planet, the planet Mars, is inhabited. Um, and I find it curious that Right as we discover life on Mars as a matter of natural history, uh, we find similar creatures. Here's one standing in an area we're calling the rock enclosure. This is on, on Sulkowski Ridge, which is the landform in the left middle distance in, in PIA 10214. This is clearly an artificial structure here. You might be able to make out the solar face on this rock here. But here we have a humanoid. You can see his bulbous head, his spindly body. He seems to be wearing pants with possibly a belt or a tool belt of some kind. And he's interacting with s smaller humanoids that are back here. This is the first photograph of a humanoid on another planet published on Earth. And I find it curious that it so closely resembles um, the, uh, the aliens identified in the UFO contact literature. We can also find similar creatures with bulbous heads and, and spindly bodies in this area that we're calling the Rock Garden, which is over on the far right of PIA 10214. There's one sitting here as we would sit, let's say if we were playing a guitar. Here's his head, shoulders, and legs. Here's what is apparently a female with multiple appendages, and she's sitting in a somewhat more demure fashion with her legs behind her. As I mentioned, there's one sitting in the hands of this sculpture in the back. I don't think that's a creature in the ground there. I'm fairly sure that that's a sculpture of a skull. There's one standing here as if throwing something. And there's one sitting here that was masked by NASA. Now, why would they have masked this image of a humanoid but not the others? Well, this one has the distended belly of a pregnant female. And so my speculation there is that as human beings, we certainly visually focus uh, on a pregnant female, for example, to avoid harming her just because she is the bearer of life, as it were. But they did put some kind of panel over this humanoid here to conceal the fact that there's a female with a distended belly sitting with her on her hand. She's leaning like we do when we're, when we're sitting on the grass. We push our hands back to prop ourselves up. And if you look more carefully here, there are little baby or um, 
pupillae on the ground. So she may actually be observing her progeny over here, further in, uh, to the left. But it's clearly a, a pregnant female. So, and that is an artificial screen that has been placed over the photograph in the one that NASA uh, published on the internet. These are skeletons? No, I believe these are living humanoids, uh, essentially recreating. Let's take a closer look at it. Here we have clearly an artificial skull, and, and also when you evaluate this soil here relative to the rest of the photograph, it's darker as if it's been tamped down like we find here in Southern Cal, you know, on, on, at the beach or at a campsite. People have been walking around pushing the, pushing the c compressing the dirt. Okay, so this, this soil is actually darker, and they're engaged apparently in different recreational activities. This individual has some kind of device, either a musical instrument or a keyboard in his lap, we, uh, we found that this one over here may be playing something like a, a guitar or something. Uh, this one, by the way, has its, its arms and hands up to its face as we would to play a saxophone, let's say, or, or the harmonica or something. So she's applying something to her mouth, and this one is standing in the way that we would if we were to throw a baseball, let's so, say. So I think what we can gain from those clues is that they're recreating there, doing something. They may be playing music uh, at a campsite, but they're clearly... Uh, in candid positions that, by which we can presume that they're, they're alive rather than statues. They may, of course, be statues because we're going to have to go back there and see if they're still there to determine whether they're moving or not, to determine whether they're life forms versus statues. But they're at least the, the, the remnants of intelligent life that placed them there if they're statues. I think they're life forms because not only do we find images like this that are blurred in the photographs indicating movement, but they're in random positions that I don't think an artist would capture them in. Um, I think that NASA is not telling the truth about the size of the landforms that they're photographing in the pictures. I think they're human size, but I, that's pretty much an intuitive guess on my part. We don't, at this point, we don't know whether NASA is um, coming clean in terms of the size that they're photographing. NASA, for example, claims that Sulkovsky Ridge is only 100 feet wide. And I took the ridge and I, I basically analyzed the size and I found that the being standing in the rock enclosure that I showed previously, if Sokovsky Ridge is 100 feet wide, that creature has shoulders that are only about 6 inches wide, indicating maybe a height of several feet, um, such as a child on Earth. Um, so if we can rely on NASA's claim that Sokovsky Ridge is 100 feet, then these creatures are smaller than us. But they're not by any means microscopic. They're just diminutive humanoids. And the atmosphere and temperature, is it the same as there? Uh, NASA and the science community claims that um, there is no atmosphere that's breathable on Mars and also that Mars is very cold. I think in one of my writings for Mars, I, I, you know, I said notions like that have even been dropped into popular songs. I think there's an Elton John song, you know, that Mars is you know, cold as hell. <laughs> It wasn't cold as hell when I was there. It was about as warm as today is here in Los Angeles. Uh, and after I took my helmet off, off, I was able to breathe the Martian atmosphere. Okay. So I think these are scientific, uh, this is scientific data in furtherance of the cover-up of, of, of life on Mars. Alternative 3 video is right then, because they show uh, when the Russians and American land, we have the YouTube video. The guy, Russian guy says, uh, atmosphere pressure, blah, 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 and everything matches the Earth. So. Yeah, it, it's, it's a livable planet. It certainly took some adjustment. I felt very labored after several hours up there with, with Courtney Hunt. And I was mentioning to somebody here today that my thighs started to ache really keenly after a couple hours of walking around the surface. So it's, there's definitely less oxygen in their atmosphere, but it's enough to sustain human life and activity. And what color was the sky? The sky was light baby blue, kind of like Arizona is when you have high, wow. Uh, wow. You know, high cloud cover that's very widely distributed. I didn't see any clouds, but you had a kind of a diffuse baby blue, as if there was high cloud cover. Wow. How, well, many, how many bases you saw there? I only saw one, and both times I was up there in 1981, I teleported to the, the, the jump room there at El Segundo, took me to the same location. You would ask questions how many bases there is over? Yeah, there was the same base. I don't think it was the one featured in Bob Dean's photograph, but I think that it was, I can certainly say it was similar in construction, you know, being a big sort of organic concrete thing like you'd, like you'd put in the ground to actually build a baseball stadium on top of it. You know? um, but uh, th so the door opened up. Hunt had instructed me that there was a staircase that would be on my right. I walked out across this deep under military, underground military base type floor. 
up the stairwell and then into kind of a dugout area uh, like you'd find in a baseball stadium behind the eyes. And then as instructed, I walked through the eye sockets and there was somebody waiting for me there. Did they have Air Force uh, clothing or uh, jumpsuit? N no, they had, they had no specialized breathing equipment and no specialized clothing. They were just in street clothes. No symbols or not? No. But the Martians that we, my father and I met at Curtis Wright in 1970 had tight-fitting silver spacesuits. Of course, they were Martian astronauts with a sort of crimson red five-sided um, design on the chest with a yellow thunderbolt going down. So they were actually in the insignia of the Mar you know, their, of their Air Force or astronaut corps. Can you elaborate on the jump room? The jump room was a little bit larger than a conventional elevator uh, in an office building, and it was essentially indistinguishable from one because we went up to the fifth floor, and I didn't realize that was the device that they were going to use to send me to Mars. And it simply closed. You know, I said, you know, light this candle. I was getting impatient about the fact that they hadn't started the process. And the strangest thing was the tremendous pressure about halfway through, about 10 minutes into the experience, the jump room began to morph into more of a cylindrical shape, and so you had to kind of prop yourself up against the wall of the elevator because the floor was becoming more sort of cylindrical and oblate. And it actually became essentially almost a complete cylinder, and then that process reversed itself and the pressure began to abate. So it was really just sort of a uniform elevator-looking device. There was no equipment that I can say, well, this is what was inside of it. It looked virtually indistinguishable from a, no a conventional elevator. No vibration or sound or uh, No vibration or sound, but a very strange uh, morphing of the shape of the, of the elevator, which, you know, Why sorry. do you think they brought you up there? What was their intention? Well, they may have just been preparing baseline information on something like psychological reactions to be on another planet or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I certainly think the fact that I had teleported in Pegasus as a child played a role. I know that the CIA knew that I would be principally associated with the discovery of life on Mars because, as I said, they, they had me read my paper and try to remember as much of it as possible in 1971. So I was implicated in the Mars timeline in that sense. Maybe their goal was to allow me to go up there and just get acclimated to Mars so that that would inform my later research and writing about Mars. I mean, they really didn't tell me. It was sort of like, well, you're going to Mars. And I said, well, no, I'm, you know, I'm going to UCLA. You know, I'm, I don't want to do this. <laughs> and uh, and uh, nonetheless, he said, well, you can't really you know, say no, so just get ready. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, but he never revealed what the purpose of it was. And I don't even know if the episode right before getting back to the skull to get down to the jump room during the second trip was a real event or not. But we were certainly chased by one of these plesiosaur-like creatures and leaped into the eye socket to evade it. So um, I, it didn't look like it was necessarily such a control. It was either n not controlled for or it was some kind of propagated event that they were just trying to get me used to the fact that when you're on the surface of Mars, you better be mindful of the fact that there are predators that roam the surface. And did you notice any physiological changes after being there? No. Um, I think at that age, you know, when you're going to college, you're, you're, you're knocking yourself out a lot, you know, studying and, and recreating. So I can't really say that I had less energy or lower immune function or anything like that. Or more, yeah. Um, no, there, there, were, there were no physical changes that I knew of. In the intervening years, I've often wondered, what are they doing to control for the transmission of viruses and bacteria from people they're sending up there? Um, and so I, there, was, it, there was such minimal training for it, too, that that also astounds me, that, that it was just a couple of afternoons of talking about what was going to happen. Well, if they are not too fond of the life that's there that they've discovered, they probably wouldn't be too concerned about contaminating the virus. Yeah, maybe they're not concerned about contaminating the life there. there, for, there yeah, yeah um, but there was no... I, d I didn't have any medical evaluations or anything like that when I got back, so maybe the disease profile up there... Uh, is the same as on Earth. We do know that in all likelihood, the humans that look like us, and I'm going to show you shortly, actually, let me go through. These are just transparent beings, sort of an anomaly. Like a horse. Yeah, th they're, they're hard to see, so let me just shotgun through that. The, 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 uh, the third kind are human insect hybrids, like the scorpion man. Yeah. I found it intriguing that Jordan Maxwell mentioned what the metaphysical or, uh, or mythological significance of scorpions are. Here's a scorpion man that you can see on the far right distance in PIA 10214. Here's his head. He's got horns. And here are his shoulders. 
He looks like he's in a blue wetsuit, and then he's got a classically segmented arachnid body like a scorpion. It goes up in a tail. And there are three little, presumably his progeny here, but standing behind him. Here's a little bit more of a condensed shot. You can see the head. And he's actually looking at the rover. And one of the, one of the things I had to resolve is that if NASA wasn't propagating fake images here, why are so many of the creatures looking at the rovers? And then we found out because they put lights and sound effects on the rovers to create bursts of light and clicking sounds and so forth to cause the creatures on the surface of Mars to look at the rovers and be photographed. So this is my favorite, the Scorpion Man, so I'm sorry, I'm unique. <laughs> Alternative three movie when Americans and Russians land in Mars, uh, they say something is moving and uh, some creature goes on the ground that you can see the ground is moving and something like a big worm or something. There's so certainly a lot of that. Bur bur there's a great evidence of burrowing by both humanoids and animal species on Mars. I mean, that's, that's, it's sort of like in deserts on, on Earth. Um, and so I was struck, I mean, I've looked at this in th through different lenses now, and th the body is very scorpion-like. And in fact, uh, somebody on Facebook sent me a picture from Egypt of an identical uh, form. There's an, uh, an Egyptian god or goddess that is a human-scorpion hybrid. Now, of course, we know there was a linkage between ancient Egypt and ancient Mars. In fact, Mars, the organization that I founded, has found evidence of the Egyptian presence. Of course, other researchers have indicated this in the past from the satellite images. You know, large pyramidal forms uh, have been found, for example, south of the face on Mars at Cydonia. That was the focus of a major study done by Richard Hoagland and Carl Munch, in which they established that that pyramidal complex near the DNM, the so called DNM pyramid complex near Cydonia, mirrors an identical land site at Giza in, in Egypt, at Avebury in England and um, uh, the Washington, D.C. site plan. Um, so recently we published a paper, I don't have it in this presentation, so I'd urge you to visit the Annals of Mars at projectmars.net. And one of my last papers was on the face of a pharaoh that we found carved into a rock on Mars that was taken by the rover Spirit. So we've actually identified now the ancient connection between Egypt and Mars in images from the rovers, not just from um, satellite images taken miles above the surface of Mars. The fourth typology that I was able to identify in PI 10214 are large uh, bulbous headed creatures that may either be just comedic statues or buildings. They're very similar to let's say the floats and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. We're calling this one uh, Mr. Potato Head because of his large eyes here and ears and bulbous nose and goofy smile and then he's kind of on a, a pedestal that looks sort of like feet. This is fairly large because it's taken from, I mean, the, 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 this anomaly is way in the distance near the lake, the azure blue colored lake that is at the base of Husband Hill, west of the home plate plateau. But that's clearly either a life form or an artificial structure like a large comedic statue of some kind. The fifth typology are the humans that can be seen in different places in this image. I mentioned that people around the world are sending me other images of humanoids on Mars. They, they have common characteristics. They seem to be male. They are almost always bald. And they very typically or very frequently wear these large body suits. I'm calling them caftans because that's the closest thing that I can think of here in apparel here on planet Earth. For example, in the Middle East, people wear large uh, body covering uh, clothing. It's almost, let's say, almost like a trench coat perhaps on Earth as well because you can see his feet here. We know this is a life form, in answer to your question, because this is one of the images where there's a double exposure, just like we find in our U.S. Civil War photographs here on Earth, where the subject of the photograph moved during the resolution of the photograph. And so movement is one of the signs of life because most life forms are mobile rather than sessile. And so um, I think that's additional evidence that these are life forms. Uh, we found many photographs of bald-headed, apparently male creatures in these black and blue caftans. This one is a little bit harder to see. Um, I'm calling this the Dr. Evil character here. He's basically um, bald and we also find the Martians in these sort of gray Nehru jackets like Mike Myers wore as Mr. Dr. Evil in the Austin Powers movies. So one wonders whether they're dropping um, Martian themes into our feature films. but. Uh, 
almost all of those bald humanoids that look very much like us are in these body, you know, full-length caftans or body suits. Um, now, we also have found abundant evidence of animal species on Mars. I've outlined four categories, the first being those uh, that exist on Earth at this time or that closely resemble animals that presently exist on Earth. Here, these, some of these are statues, some I believe are life forms. Uh, here we have an elephant, a duck-billed platypus or hippopotamus-like creature, and these are actually progeny that are sort of breastfeeding uh, along the, the uh, um, belly of this creature. This seemingly has fur and is very large. It's way, again, in the far distance of PIA 10214 uh, on the banks of the, of the blue lake that's beneath Husband Hill. I think it's a life form, but a very large one. To me, this resembles more of a living horse than a statue of a horse. We see here in this cow or steer, again in the far distance, the black uh, shiny fur of some undulates on Earth. Just yesterday when I was driving down here from um, my home in Washington State, um, I got a call from somebody who heard my appearance on Coast on Wednesday and said, you know, the Illuminati has cattle ranches up there. I said, oh, did you see the image of the cow that I included in my original paper? And he said, no, that was from another source. So uh, here's a frog. It could be a statue, but maybe it's a living frog. Some sort of turtle or snail-like creature. Here are some of the serpents that are so ubiquitous on Mars. This one has a goofy human-like face on it. But these are sort of snakes or leeches of some kind uh, on Solkovsky Ridge. And here we have, this is a little bit difficult to see, but here we have a creature with a body like a slug and the face um, of a human. And some of the faces are very Dr. Seuss-like. I wonder whether Ted Geisel may have been a Martian. But uh, very common for the faces to be very Dr. Seuss-like. Now, the second category of animal species uh, on Mars combines the elements of animal species that inher inhabit Earth at this time in our biological history, and then, our, and then from our perspective are hybrids of living animal species. This one is sort of a hybrid of, of a dog or lion-like face and an octopus-like body, but it's perambulating toward the spirit on the land, so it clearly can't be an octopus. This is a little bit overexposed with this lighting. You can see here on my laptop that we can see the mouth and everything. It's just like a dog approaching you in a friendly way, but it has more of an oct octopus-like body. I mentioned the plesiosaurs. You know, here on Earth, they have been conjectured as the solution, basically, to the Loch Ness, Lake Champlain, and Lake Okanagan mysteries. They're all over the place on Mars. And I, in fact, I was chased by one uh, when I went up there with Courtney Hunt. Uh, in fact, when we leapt into the skull to get back to the underground uh, location where the jump room was, I said, was that thing a, a carnivore, I, I think is what I said, rather than predator. And he said, hell yes, it has teeth all the way down its throat. So on Earth, they were, uh, plesiosaurs were predators, and I believe they are also on Mars. How big is it? Um, certainly as big as the humanoids. Um, reasons why the Martians would still preserve life forms like this on the surface for which they could lose their lives would be perhaps life is so tenuous there that they actually have a very high standard of environmental protection, of, of endangered species protection as it were, and they haven't even rid uh, Mars of plesiosaurs in the way that we probably rid the earth of dragons and so forth. Um, here we have one leaping or falling out of an, an embankment of dirt, so if it's a statue, it's a, a strange statue to make, half leaping out of, a, of an embankment. Um, there are also hybrids that are more lizard-like. I'm calling these the Gumby lizards because their bodies are sort of segmented <laughs> like Gumby. Um, I'm, calling, I'm giving some of these fanciful names so that school children can identify with them and become involved in the research as you know, our later Mars explorers as our presence on Mars increases if it hasn't already gotten to 600,000 uh, as David Wilcock claims. But in this case, I was kind of fascinated that these creatures have a body like, sort of like a sea sponge, but friendly puppy dog faces. So I just called it the Woofy in honor of some of my favorite pets. This one um, is looking at the rover from a very near location over on the right. It's, it's looking over rock at the rover. It has sort of a giraffe-like head with blue patches beneath its bulbous eyes and a very red mouth, almost like a lipstick sort of mouth. 
and you can see some blotches on its face and shoulders like a giraffe would have on Earth. I'm calling it the spying giraffe because it's peering at the rover spirit and looks very much like a giraffe. Here is a living plesiosaur and presumably a dead one. So just, again, using Occam's razor, the most likely explanation. If this was a statue, why would they have also made a statue of a carcass of a plesiosaur? You'd think they'd make another living plesiosaur. Um, carcasses of animals are very infrequently the basis of the theme of a statue on Earth, right? So if we can project some of our human psychology and sentiment on the Martians, I think that this would probably be more probative of the notion that that's a living plesiosaur and this is the carcass of, of a dead one, rather than that they're both statues. Because they would have to be both statues if that was our explanation for what they were. I don't know if that kind of links up, but I think that's the remains of a living plesiosaur. And this one that seems to be peering to its left is, is a live one. It's also, you can see the tail here, right here as on a, a dog or a turtle. Very turtle-like. These colors are very gray-green. They come out much better at, in better formats than this. Um, we also have found evidence of predation of humanoids by reptoid creatures. Here you can see the head of a reptoid. What is in his mouth being held by these appendages is a, a humanoid that it's tearing apart. Here's the head right here and it's basically dining on a humanoid here and there's the half the, of a body of a humanoid over here. Here we have again another bulbous-eyed green rep, reptilian creature <coughs> with a humanoid uh, corpse here with the head and, and its feet here. Its feet have been bitten off. So uh, this is some of the unpleasant evidence of um, reptoid predation of humans. Yeah, this is, PI, this is from PIA <coughs> 11049. <coughs> yeah, if you could. <coughs> I'm doing do so much talking in my law practice and interviews. Can I take a break? Can you find Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, sorry for that, but you know, the, the, the medical theme of Donald Rumsfeld's, you know, we're, we're rolling? When, when Donald Rumsfeld gave the briefing when I was a kid on Pegasus in April of 71, from the underground lo uh, lo location uh, at the Surreal's Cultural Center, he said so far, you know, we've had questions about medical consequences of the teleportation. The only thing we know thus far is it's causing dehydration. So I've been kind of dehydrated ever since. Um, so when I talk all week long, I end up, end up drying out like that, so I apologize. Wow. But ba basically... Oh, I'm sorry. This, this one? Okay, so I was just saying that um, one of the side effects of teleportation is dehydration, so I'm just always trying to remain hydrated. And um, so I apologize for that, for that uh, moment there, but uh, so let's get started again. Um, the point here is that you know, we're looking at large reptiles, at least reptiles that are larger than humanoids, dining on them, which kind of um, is a disquieting thought for us because we're pretty much on the top of our food chain here on Earth. Occasionally a human being will be eaten by a lion or a tiger or a bear or a shark or something like that. But reptoid predation of humanoids is commonplace on the surface of Mars, and I think this will test the limits of the prime directive. Should we let humanoids perish? as the food for reptoids on Mars to preserve the balance of nature there and show respect for the Martian environment or should we intervene to save humanoids from such predation because it is the ethical thing to do? Well, it's ethical because we would identify with them as humanoids, right? And so I don't, this isn't a casual question. I really think this puts two major legal and philosophical precepts in collision. Do we preserve the environment there or do we rescue endangered humanoids? as we would on Earth, saving somebody from a lion attack, for example. It seems to me, with the forms that you're showing, that they are genetically engineered hybrids of various forms, and therefore it may not be a natural environment. Correct. The, the, the hybridization is so commonplace in the life forms that we're finding up there that these may be part of a, 
of a genetic hybridization program actually initiated on this planet, either in this epoch of civilization or in a previous one. So that, that maybe it isn't a natural environment worthy of protection, but just a large experiment going on up there. The, this kind of pre predation by reptoids may be the basis for all the bodies that we found, find both on the home plate plateau in these large slag heaps and also beyond the uh, home plate plateau to the west. Nonetheless, we do have this theme of reptoid predation of humans, and uh, maybe this is an, a matter of international, uh, or excuse me, interplanetary security significance, ultimately. We don't know. There's also an abundant amount of carved statues in PIA 10214. Thus far, I found 12 statues of humanoids and animal heads just on Sokovsky Ridge itself. So if Sokovsky Ridge is 100 feet, I've already identified 12 statues there. So carving, carving natural boulders into faces, as we find, in, obviously, in the, most, in the most famous example, the face on Mars at Cydonia, is simply put, characteristically Martian. It's a, a d predominant art form there. These are t uh, eight examples. These are faces and heads of humanoid and animal forms just on Sokovsky Ridge. Here we have like a large moon-like face, more of a fish or dog-like head here with the eyes there, nose and mouth, kind of a smile. Sort of a monkey-like head listing over to the left if you look at it that way, but also also the Martians do a lot of superimposition of faces and heads on their, in their artwork. You can also see a sort of a Casper the Friendly Ghost sort of face looking out to the right. If these are the front eye sockets and that's the nose, here's yeah, the mouth. That's a, that's a face. All right, that's, that's a face, right? Yeah. yeah, and and but it's also a face looking this way if you use this as the mouth and that as the right eye rather than the left eye. This is a very unusual form. It, it's essentially a human head. Here you see the goatee, the nose, the eyes, and it has one of those traditional German military helmets with a spike on the top. We were wondering whether that was actually a decapitated head from World War I on Earth or something. Maybe, maybe it is. We don't know. This is more of a mask like, or excuse me, I have the wrong. This is more of a sort of corpulent face looking towards me here. You see the cheeks, the mouth, the eyes, the nose. Uh, this, this one we call Loggins and Messina. <laughs> this is kind of like more of a bearded hippie kind of look, and there are two faces there. Here we have, we call this the hockey mask. It looks like a goalie's mask looking to the right. And there's also a highly articulated one here that looks very much sort of cubist. So these are artworks, and they seem to have been done, in this case, just for the enjoyment of the Martian artist. They don't mark the opening to anything. They're, they're statues that are sitting on the hillside there. I already have uh, shown this one, which is the, we're calling this the grotesque humanoid skull. You can see it a little bit more clearly here in black and white. Here's the pointy head, the large elephant, elephantine ears, the deep eye sockets, and the hand coming out of the ground. And so at this point, it's, it's easy to see that the face on Mars at Cydonia was always what the leading lights of Mars anomaly research have been telling us for the last 30 years, an artificial, uh, an artificial object. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yesterday in Mike Barra's presentation, there was a picture very much like that, which may have been Mars. I thought it was the moon. Is there something just like that on the moon as well? I don't know. In fact, I'm staying away from the moon because I'm inundated with, with data from Mars. I've just decided to, to not, to not uh, address it. Uh, there may be, but I would point out that you know the former um, chief astronomer for the U.S. Navy, the late uh, great Dr. Tom Van Flanderen, stated that the chances of this structure being artificial are 1,000 billion billion to one. I mean, so when you have the leading scientist for the Navy concluding it's artificial uh, at that degree of probability, that's essentially tantamount to saying we've determined it's artificial. There's just a tiny little chance that that one grain of sand and the, all the beaches of all the oceans <coughs> of the world is it, it, just led to this accident of, of face on Mars at Cydonia. But at this point, since there are so many other faces and heads, even of a much smaller nature, right. and we've also cor corroborated the satellite data with the rover data now, um, it's just so commonplace in the pictures that we have to conclude that this is simply 
the predominant Martian art form. They just love carving their... In fact, I, I think I mentioned that we now have... Um, my organization is in possession of an image of a humanoid carving a statue. So we've actually wow. now have a photograph of the artistic process itself. You had a question right here? Oh, no, I was... Uh, so you were actually in that I thought I wasn't... I didn't, I didn't access the Martian surface through this statue. It's clearly a different statue. Oh, different. But in my training, Hunt explained how on Mars, they use skull-like structures like this to mask or actually to, to, to indicate to humans that there's an access point to the underground civilization below, and, then, and hence our base was recessed into the ground below that, and he had instructed me how to walk up the stairs and out onto the surface via the back of the eye sockets. Um, I was in a very small portion of the base. It was just sort of like this deep underground concrete structure. There was, there was very little there besides the elevator. Did there was... Did you see any UFOs or flying objects? I saw no flying objects on Mars during uh, both trips, or e either trip, but the three Martian astronauts that left Curtis Wright in 1970 that we briefly met with were I in a conventional craft. It was a small silver craft that looked sort of like a st an aerodynamically designed automobile, uh, but with no wheels, and it just sort of hovered across the tarmac there at Curtis Wright and then took off at a tremendous rate of speed. But it was, not, like? it was not a superluminal craft. It was a conventional craft. What did you look like, these two people? Yeah. They were three in number, and as I've described in my writings, they looked like any combination of three of the four Three Stooges. Larry, Curly, and Shemp. No. Or <laughs> no, that's not apocryphal. That's really my description. They looked peculiar to a, 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 a ten-year-old New Jersey lad. Uh, no, they were our size. In fact, two of them were larger than my dad and the other project engineers there. They looked basically like, as I've said in another one of my writings, basically like bald, ugly white guys. Were they nice? <laughs> they were very nice. In fact, the, one, the, the last one to walk past us turned and said to my dad, in perfect, unaccented, standard American English, well, it was a pleasure visiting your beautiful planet again, Ray, and seeing you again and meeting your, your son, Andrew. I hope that we can meet again. So they were actually very, yeah, they, that, that one spoke English, but in a very high voice. And my dad explained on the way home, that's because their vocal cords have evolved in an atmosphere with less oxygen in it. So just as when we breathe helium and try to talk, his voice was very high pitched, but it was perfect American English. So perhaps their astronauts study the languages of the planets that they visit. I don't, I don't know. Um, well, we have forms in the pictures that seem to be women, such as around the rock garden there, but yet they don't seem to be as commonly on the surface or as great in number um, because they seem underrepresented in the photographs, and we have no explanation for that. But the three astronauts from Mars that my dad and I had that encounter with were males. What's the chronology of <coughs> Mars being a planet of war? Um, I think the, the, the mythology around Mars being the planet of war, or Ares, Mars, is the fact that Mars was devastated by that solar system catastrophe of 9500 BC when we believe debris elements from the Vela supernova explosion entered our atmosphere and may have destroyed a planet where the asteroid belt is, but at a minimum pummeled Mars, fracturing it, squishing it into an oblate spheroid, more oblate than Earth, and causing massive devastation on Earth that eclipsed that first civilization on Earth. That was a major event in our, our terrestrial history here on Earth. Um, so I think that is probably the, 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 in w the way in which history informed myth that because there had been such a severe disaster in the, in the solar system that affected that interplanetary confederation that we were in with Mars, Mars then became associated with warfare and, and catastrophe. Two of the most striking uh, statues that I found in PIA 10214 are the one that, <coughs> excuse me, that we're calling the face of a boy. That's this pewter-like one looking out. You can see his flat head, his brow, his eye sockets, his nose, and his sort of cherubic mouth. He juts out from a very beautiful carving that I'm calling the Mask of the Medicine Man, this kind of turquoise and coral face you can see here. Here's the lips, the nose, the closed eyes. And also this statue that I'm calling the head of a dog, sort of a Doberman Pinscher-like head here with even the smooth uh, forehead of that breed of dog on Earth, 
apparently indicated in the way that this face of a dog or possibly a reptile has been carved. These are all over the place on Mars, so that when you find a place where, where there has been carving, there's been a lot of carving. They're not exactly uh, environmentally uh, conscious in terms of what they select to turn from a rock into a statue. They're doing a lot of terraforming on their own planet. I mentioned that location. I'm calling this Shaman Point because at that location we can see either a statue or a humanoid struggling up the cliff. I suggest that this may be some kind of healing center, maybe a vista point, maybe some sort of religious shrine. It's an extremely exquisite uh, landform, and I think this will be sort of the Mount Rushmore of the solar system when we go up and get better pictures of that. This is an exquisite location, far more beautiful, than, I think, than any um, landform that's been converted into a carving on Earth, like our example, I guess, would be Mount Rushmore. But here's, here it is in color. You've got the face of the boy in sort of a pewter-colored metal, perhaps. It might even have been brought up there and welded into the cliff. And somehow they, they learned how to carve the natural rock there and, and derive this turquoise and pink face of the, or mask of the medicine man, as I'm calling it. There's also a set of stairs that have been carved in a terraced way up to this location. And here we see either a statue or a humanoid actually struggling up the, the ramp here to get to this vista point. So it's obviously something significant in their culture. Here's the head of a dog. Here, sh here, this photograph shows how densely packed these anomalies actually are on Mars. Here's the face of the dog. There's another face of a dinosaur-like creature here. The face of a dinosaur, perhaps, or some reptile. And then we have the spying giraffe looking over that location. So the data is very dense where data is found. <coughs> that was from, uh, these are all from PIA 10214, except, same one, same one. yeah, that, that, that goes to my major premise, yeah. PIA 10214 is the Yosemite of Mars, Mars anomalies. There's so much data in it that we haven't, after two, well, two years now, we're still finding stuff. It just depends on putting another person on the image and say, okay, what can you find? It's literally filled with creatures, sculptures, um, it's phenomenal. And, uh, so here, this is just a, you know, this is right to the right of the rover spirit, and here you're finding two faces and a, apparently a living creature looking over those statues at the rover. Isn't that like Pompeii, the uh, volcano stuff, uh, just frozen uh, animals and creatures? And I, had, I asked myself whether the statues were the remains of a civilization that had been inundated by water or soil or volcanic right. eruption back when I was studying the... Um, little figure of the lady on the left side of the cliff, the famous one. And I concluded that it wasn't from that because there was so much intentionality in, in terms of the way the, the sculptures were carved and placed. And maybe this next set of images will kind of uh, bear uh, out that point. These are all from the uh, same location. If you, if you go down the cliff from the little statue of the lady in the blue dress, there's a set of animal uh, sculptures. And they're, they've obviously been placed in a kind of a display like you would in a a public art gallery on, on Earth. You have the steel of a face here. You can see a kind of a human face, eyes, nose, mouth. The head of a lion looking to the right, although they masked that with some kind of overlay right here, just as they did with the pregnant female to the right side of the image. A kind of a horse face here with the eyes here and the mane here and the mouth. This is a beautiful tropical fish carving that's also been dragged up to be in a kind of a display with the other sculptures rather than being the random remains of, let's say, a culture that had been inundated with volcanic ash or something like that. And here's my favorite stat statue because it, I'm somewhat egotistical, it actually yields Andy B, right? Because this is the head of a man, mm -hmm. Ander would be the Greek stem, <laughs> and then a bee, but the bee's on its back. It's been carved out of the sculpture, out of, it's been sculpted out of the cliff face here, and you have the bottom of the bee they did a beautiful job on the wings here. You don't really pick it up in here, but on, on my laptop you can see them. They carved into the cliff here to make the wings look like they were moving, like the transparent wings of a bee. And, you know, here we find a bee on its back with the head of a man, right when we're having a crisis of bee die-off going on here on Earth, right when in turn this statue is discovered on, on Mars. Very strange. That's, in addition to just the creativity of that, of that sculpture, that's my favorite because of all the 
layers of meaning just in that, in that form. How big is that um, I, again, I don't know the size. I, I think it's about 10 feet long, but that's just, again, these are kind of intuitive just surmises. I don't, we really don't know because we don't know whether the space agency is telling us the truth about how, of what the parameters of the whole photograph are. There, there's so much data in the photographs that it looks like these are vast areas with a lot of concentrated data. You know, my example of, you know, looking out a, across the San Fernando Valley. It's difficult to see somebody walking down the street there in Van Nuys, right? Uh, I think it's a vast distance with rather large sculptures and human-sized uh, humanoids, but that's just my guess. This is as big a statue. Does it mean that there were uh, big bees on Mars? I don't know, but it's interesting that it's adjacent to a statue of a king and a queen, and bees were a symbol of royalty in, to the Egyptians. So it may be another uh, example of an Egyptian artifact on Mars. But I think I have a, a blow-up of this one. It's my favorite. It's just so far out, basically. It's such an unusual sculpture. Here you see this kind of Ray Walston. Was that my favorite Martian? Was that, was that his name, the actor? <laughs> Maybe it celebrates the career of Ray, Ray Walston and my favorite Martian. Uh, but here, here it's kind of a metallic head. Mm -hmm. And here you have the wings and then this very well-executed lower body of a bee. Andrew, that's not a, a statue. That's a real animal. That, that's been, we thought it might be, but, but then we really studied the wings and the way they're, they're actually carved into the cliff to make them look uh, diaphanous and moving, like a bee's wings move. So we've concluded that it's not um, a hybrid backed up against the cliff, but in fact was carved from it. But that, that's our conclusion. You may, you may be right. And so we're, you know, no, we're not making any final judgments on these. It could be a large bee with the head of a man that just fell and is on its back near the cliff. Right, right here, there's, um, there's a, I'll do the outline of the head. Here's the mouth, the nose, the brow, and then the head here. He's looking this direction. But he, the, the, you don't see it? Anybody see it? Well, okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a head of, of an intelligent person who has been restricting their caloric intake, right? Like fasting. Um, it basically, it's a very spare, mature male head. Like, like Mohandas Gandhi's. Bald, and you see the mouth here and the nose. Can you see that now? Well, it's, it's, on, yeah, it's, on, it's on my laptop, so if you'd like to take a look, you can see the head here. But uh, it's some, one of the, one of the um, you see? Where do you see that? Right, right here. In terms of pattern recognition, this is actually a good example of some of the challenges to Mars anomaly research, because if you look at this form, you're expecting to see the head of a bee in the right orientation. In fact, they've placed the metallic head of a man in that location in the wrong orientation. So when we look at their artwork, sometimes it's difficult to immediately identify what's in it because the elements don't follow what we would expect in a biological form on Earth or an archaeological one. This is proof that these are carved objects of considerable weight that have been artificially made and in some cases pushed to their location because they, <laughs> yeah, because like a heavy piece of furniture being pushed across a plush carpet, the tropical fish statue has been dragged up the plateau, also indicating that somebody had to do that because if that was a piece of rock that was tumbling down that side of the plateau, not only would it not have a regular trail here, this linear vector have been created here by being pushed, but it would have tumbled down the cliff rather than be pushed up it. So this is an indication on many levels that this is a heavy carved structure that was pushed in place by intelligent life forms. Uh, up on the right side of the cliff we have four adjacent objects. This is the a, a kind of a sarcophagus of a king. Uh, I have better color rendering than that elsewhere. We also have here the um, the form that we're calling the water sprite. This is a female form that is leaning off the edge of the cliff. It may be an aqueduct of some kind. Here we have a structure, kind of a highly articulated bull or reptile face. I think this is probably a viewing platform of some kind. It looks like some of the houses that you have around the San Fernando Valley where you have it kind of terraced into the hillside. And you can kind of stand there and look out uh, on the valley. And then here we have either a fossil or another sculpture of, of a dinosaur or reptile-like face, and there are little Martians actually standing in the mouth looking out. 
as human children would looking out, out of a jungle gym or something. Um, I thought these might represent the four seasons on Earth. I want to do more of an investigation to see how the seasons change on, on Mars in the sense that we find perhaps the pharaoh is asleep and represents winter um, and then along comes spring embodied in the, in the water sprite and then during summer when the sun is at full rage in the sky that's embodied in the face of a bull which is one of, obviously one of the more aggressive animals and then as the sun begins to slumber as we move into autumn I'm wondering if that's represented in a lizard uh, because of course lizards have to uh, sit in the sun to heat up right because they're cold-blooded but it's kind of curious that metaphorically or mythologically these could represent the characteristics of the four seasons but they're certainly highly articulated objects to be to appear so close to each other yeah. <clears throat> you can see some of the color here in the sarcophagus of the king you've got a tomb-like body just like we would make let's say when we attach a head to let's say a bottle of liquor or something like that uh, a, an intact neck, even though it's very narrow. It's a male with a beard and an eye. And what, what, what amazed us when we analyzed this image is it not only has a conical headpiece that is identical in shape to the one that was discovered at Amarna, Egypt by the German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt in 1912, namely the famous statue of, or bust of N Queen Nefertiti, who was the, the, queen, and, uh, the queen, after all, to Akhenaten, Pharaoh Akhenaten, whose nickname was the Sun God, and may literally have been the Egyptian monarch when our Earth civilization actually was in an interplanetary confederation with Mars. But in addition to the shape of the headpiece being identical, it also bears the same drab green and blood red uh, of the famous uh, hat on Nefertiti. So it, presumably it's from the same, the same culture, the same time period. So there's the, the sarcophagus of the king, and right next to it, this form we're calling the water sprite, leaning over to pick up water out of a river or distribute water in an aqueduct outlet right there. What I'm calling the face of a bull, which I think is a viewing platform because it has sort of this M.C. Escher kind of design where there may be internal platforms in it, and then this face of a, or head of a lizard, uh, which may be a fossil but is probably also a statue. This is the recent picture I was talking about. Here we have a Martian humanoid with some kind of saw-like device in its hands that's actually carving. You can see the faces here. He's actually shaping this stone here. And if I had used the larger version of this picture, these are faces here. This is sort of like the face of a dolphin-like creature. The Martian artistic sensibility is kind of like Portland, Oregon, where I spend a lot of my time, basically weird. <laughs> Yeah, it's very artistic. I was going to say that. You know, if you think about how few artists on planet Earth really reach this level of subtlety and sophistication, for example, the bee with the head of a man. I mean, that gets as esoteric and, and creative as it gets. Before you run out of time, can you talk about the um, I'll tell you what. We're, I don't know. I, I guess that since we are running out of time, I was going to get into the agenda of Mars. But basically, we have, we have two two agenda items, so maybe I could just end with that. Um, essentially, we want to continue to promote the research, the disclosure, the education of the general public about what's on Mars, because this is literally, we're going to be seeing something here in the 21st century that human beings on Earth haven't seen since the 1500s, which is basically the discovery of a new world. So we're going to continue to publish and write about what we're finding up there. But the chairman of our organization, Alfred Lam Lambermont Weber and I, are going to be promoting the adoption of a treaty under the UN to protect the ecology and civilization from visitation, exploration, habitation, and colonization by human beings from Earth. I mean, one of our most distinguished space scientists, Buzz Aldrin, has called for literally the second person to possibly walk on the moon. Um, uh, I believe they did walk on the moon, but um, has called for the colonization of Mars. and. We're very troubled by that because, after all, Mars does not belong to human beings from Earth or any, any country on Earth. It belongs to the Martians. And even the mere fact that we're visiting another terrestrial realm like that carries with it the responsibility to protect what we're exploring. And I think if we don't do that, we're going to fail our first major test of cosmic citizenship. 
So maybe just to end out on the Mars material, that's kind of where this is going. We're going to continue to publish the data and, in, and show and interpret as much of it as we can because it's, it's a huge amount of material that we're now finding. I have about 12 major papers that I want to write where it's just piling up in folders on my laptop. And our chief photo analyst, Ross Curley, now has 25 major findings to share with the public. Things like the image that Paul Goodwin found of a Martian carving a statue. So we have this huge backlog of, of material, but meanwhile, uh, we want to begin to articulate essentially an overarching Mars policy, because if we don't, we're really going to screw up relations with the other, at least the first other inhabited planet in our solar system. So maybe I could just end out on that note, um, and then maybe take any questions anybody has regarding other issues like teleportation. teleportation. What would you like to know? The, uh, the teleportation unit that was at Curtis Wright, kind of the shop floor model, derived from discoveries that Nikola Tesla made regarding what he was calling radiant energy. I don't know if that's the same energy in the Tesla literature. That has among its characteristics the ability to bend time space. So when we were jumping through the energy field propagated by the armatures of that device, essentially what was happening is a, is a vortal tunnel was opening up in time space. So rather than being disintegrated and reintegrated elsewhere, the universe was being wrapped past us, and we were simply being repositioned in this time-space continuum when the tunnel closed. Is that Contact, the movie? Um, certainly that chair ride that Jodie Foster goes on in co Contact scared the willies out of me because of how I felt as a little kid jumping into those tunnels. It didn't really look like that, or it wasn't exactly like that, but certainly the, the velocity is, was similar. It was that fast. Do you have any uh, I think. No, I think, I think the closest, I mean, George Norrie, I think, made a good point. It was much more like sliders, certainly, than Star Trek. Oh, the sliders. Yeah, it was more like sliders, where, where you jump through an energy field, and you're kind of like in this bizarre parallax effect. You know you're going through a tunnel. You know, you look to the left or right, and you see that these ribbons of light that make up the tunnel have all these random, you know, transparent random images go of things going on. So, so we were literally cutting through multiple timelines. So it was very much like sliders in that sense. And so, Uh, that was, well, that was in the jump rooms, which was a different effect. That, that was like being in an elevator that suddenly starts morphing, and then when it opens up, you're, you're elsewhere. My point is, obviously, yeah. during this process, you're capable of respiration. Well, yeah, in the jump room, there was obviously enough air to breathe during that 20 minutes. And, the other and actually, this point came up. That, that's a great question. This point came up, and my father uh, just, you know, explained to me what was going on. Even though it seemed like we were in the Vortal Tunnels for about 30 seconds, he said that the reason we could breathe in the tunnel is because we were surviving with a couple breaths of the oxygen, you know, the, the air we were pushing into the tunnel. So it, we couldn't have been in there for too long. The other thing he said relative to this question of, of respirating when you're in the tunnel, when you're, you know, when you're teleporting, is he said the first three people to teleport through the Tesla device intentionally, after the one guy accidentally got teleported to Africa, I think I'm going to mention that on coast, um, when the th were three Navy enlisted guys who asphyxiated because the tunnel was too long. In other words, the, the, the project administrators had opened up a, a vortal tunnel in time space that was so long that they ran out of air. So how, I don't know, but, but they did an experiment, I guess, across country, and they were simply in the tunnel too long and, and, and ran out of air and died. So, so there, there is an issue. Um, there, there is probably some kind of ratio between time in the tunnel how fast you're going and how much air you have left. Sometimes I would certainly be kind of a little bit out of breath when we would pop back into Bio and Santa Fe. And we were seen there, by the way. I did develop witnesses who, who, who heard of people seeing children suddenly, re, you know, suddenly popping into view in, in the state capitol complex there in Santa Fe in the early 1970s. So, so you think it's to end off, do you think it's conceivable that they realized they need to use respiration devices to get some place that's a lot further out and that they conceivably have figured that out. And they, they certainly knew when those three Navy enlisted guys died yeah. that they had to worry about how long you were in the tunnel and how, many, how much oxygen you had. When we were accidentally t teleported to 91 and jumped back from Sandia back to 1971, they put us in specialized gear because I think they were predicting that we might be in the tunnel for a long time, and we were. It was like a half hour of hell, basically. It was very violent. But let me, let me take this question right here. Uh, you were one of 140 kids. 
the program involved 140 kids, and then we were just in the manner of what Project Talent was doing in other federal projects. As individuals, we were jumping through different sets of hoops, so I don't know if all 140 actually teleported. So did you have contact with them, or did you? I was able to, I was the captain of one of the regiments. They, each of these 14 divisions of 10 kids had colors, so I was captain of blue team, which simply meant that I had specialized training about what to do, basically to pull rank if there was a mishap, like there was when we got to Santa Fe, but it wasn't 1971, it was 1991. So I knew who the kids were, I mean, I, at least seven or eight of them, and I found them, and the problem was that I uncovered evidence of their brainwashing simply by interviewing them. I'll just, let me just cite one example. I got Sharon to remember that we were taken up to ITT Defense Communications for that that virtu you know, the, the chronovisor probe to 2013 in early November of 1971. And the discrepant element of that was that a teacher from our school who had been fired for his performance the previous year was in one of the drivers in the car caravan that took us up to ITT Defense. I got her to remember that and also to begin to discuss the fact that we were in some kind of strange technical activity up there. But the next Saturday, when I interviewed her again, she not only forgot what she had said, she forgot that we had had the discussion. So I'm in the book, I'm going to show what, you know, who I found, what they confirmed, and how I proved that they were still victims of the brainwashing that I had overcome. But they did confirm important elements involving quantum access in the learning lab. The Montauk chair, the spinning to induce out-of-body experiences, the remote viewing exercises with U.S. Navy officers sometimes coming to the lab. So, they provided a lot of corroboration, but I couldn't get them over the hurdle of what happened off campus, which meant then I had to in turn reality test what I remembered that had happened off campus. And I got to the point where I not only confirmed by going to Santa Fe, but I had one of the leading scholars of the U.S. intelligence community, Dr. Jean Maria Arrigo, literally say to me, somewhat exasperated, Andy, stop asking all these, you know, seventh degree, rea degree of reality kind of doubts about what you happened. Just get with the program, man. You, you, you have uncovered what happened to you. You were in all that weird quantum exploration stuff in the early 70s. So I explored all other possibilities, you know, mind control, delusion, fantasy, mistake, um, you know, uh, uh, implantation of false memories during alien abduction. I went through all those and I ultimately found physical evidence of my presence in New Mexico I developed whistleblower testimony from people who were in the project, like Dr. Harold Agnew, Dr. Stephen J. Lukasik of DARPA, or people who heard about what was going on in the project, like Cliff Harris, the climatologist, when he was working with Dr. Ivan Browning, when Browning was Director of Science and Technology for CIA. So I'm going to just show through you know, the, the legal technique called inundation. I'm going to basically give an inundation of evidence in the book to prove that it was a real project that you were, um, because in that brainwashing, the color to achieve was the gold, right? I don't know. Um, we did have some, um, we did have some education around the idea of feeling special or not putting any limits on what we could achieve, but I think the blue color was just random because it was actually just colors that were assigned to the 14 teams. Are you, uh, let me actually, David. Let me. Can I, I, mean, I see other hands here. Huh? Just we'll come back to you right here. Wouldn't this be considered like, national security? I mean, why aren't they trying to shut you up? That's my question. Um, I've just decided to run the gauntlet of risk because I I don't want to not fulfill my destiny by being afraid of being killed. But I was. They did make an attempt to shut me up. I had a meeting in the abandoned parking lot of the Wolf, Wolf Creek Pass Ski Lodge in Southwest Colorado with somebody who represented himself as working for the executive office of the president. That had been set up, those meetings in New Mexico and Colorado in June of 2003, which included a very nice meeting that I had with Governor Bill Richardson when he was attending the, the antique car show up in Chama, New Mexico uh, on that day. Um, resulted in me being informed a lot about the fact that I was on the right track and that, you know, I was also involved in something very basically sensitive from a national security perspective because it was at that meeting with this gentleman who, you know, it was an arranged meeting through an historian, 
from Texas who had ties to the CIA and the ONI. So I was literally being told, okay, now go over here and this person will tell you something. Okay? This person was working as an intermediate between me and the intelligence community, between me and the government. During the last meeting at, at the ski lodge, he basically said that if I didn't stop researching, talking about, or writing about my project experiences, they quote unquote couldn't guarantee my survival. So that was either a veiled threat or it was them helping me by saying, if you don't shut up about the Pegasus generation of technologies, somebody else is going to kill you from another faction or something. So you mentioned so. that on the George Noy program that Pegasus and Stargate was kind of brought up and brought up as a television program. Was that in effort to discount the reality? Yeah, I was discussing the fact that, that science fiction was invented as a literary genre to put information from classified projects like this in the public domain and confuse the public about the names of the technologies, what, how they worked, to, to rebut the claims of individuals like me who would talk about classified technologies. My point there was that, star, that the first episode of Stargate Atlantis was Project Pegasus, which was literally the name of the real pr project. And I know that because when they told us what the, the, the project descriptor was, they had a drawing of Pegasus on the chalkboard. It was a beautiful drawing of a pat, you know, using pastel chalk. And also, they were using the phrase Stargate. The, the Stargate was the device that they set up at the Surreal's Cultural Center Gymnasium that we used to access the year 2045 to, to, to gather data there and bring it back to the present. Please, so, please tell us what you gathered after, any time after 2012. Well, I, I was bringing up the point that we don't need to expect or anticipate catastrophe in 2012 because all of the chronovisor probes were to different timelines. That, in fact, was uh, detected by the project when I was on it. And so my point is that if we set our intention for planetary you know, cultural renaissance in 2012 rather than catastrophe, maybe that's the timeline that we'll get to enjoy. Um, I was just raising the point that, however, they were able to discern a particular person's destiny, for example, Barack Obama's, let's say, as indicated by that experience, and I believe that was by sending people via teleportation. If you can kind of conceive of it like this, when you, were, when you jump through the teleporter, it's like jumping between rooms in the same building, the same timeline. But the chronovisors involved an energy field that they were setting up as a hologram that was having a lensing effect where other timelines were being bent into the laboratory. So the chronovisor was inherently unreliable for, for providing actionable intelligence. But I do note that by the time, certainly I had my conversations with my father during the latter part of his life in the late 1980s, that they could discern discrete data points that would happen to a particular person. Like when I asked my dad, um, such as becoming president, right? But when I asked my dad, well, what can you tell me about my future? He said, well, you go to Cambridge. And I said, what do you mean, Harvard and Cambridge, Mass? And he said, no, Cambridge, UK, you know, Cambridge University in, in the United Kingdom. And I said, I do? And he goes, yeah. And then he said, because he had shared information from the future with me, he said, so if you're invited to go there, go. Because they were always trying to give a double positive when they revealed the future to you, because they didn't want to dissuade you from pursuing a destiny by, pre you know, by revealing it to you before it occurred. So that's, that became part of my actual life experience. In other words, that's on my resume now, because I was invited to go and went there. So I'm saying that certainly by the late 80s, they could predict discrete destinies. And that means that they have a control over society that has not been contemplated, which was really why I was talking about the presidency. I think they may have done the right thing by informing future presidents of their destinies. If you, you know, Harry Truman said when, he, when Franklin Roosevelt died, I felt like the whole world had been put on my shoulders and my feet were sinking into the ground. I mean, it must be a, a god-awful thing to realize that you're going to be president of the United States when you wake up you know, on the morning of your inaugural ceremony. So I think it was probably a, the right thing that they, they said, well, we don't want to change the future, but we do want to optimize it by revealing certain information to certain people who are going to be implicated in particular destinies that have a particular consequentiality to them. And so that's why I was talking so, about that. You saw 2013 on George Money Show. You saw 2013 Washington, D.C. being on the water. We were in specialized suits, and they had us moving for about a half hour to a location where, where that, that location in time space was forming in the future. And it was almost like going there physically. You know, clearly, we were in a hologram and had specialized equipment on. It was almost like sort of flying there. And they had trained us that when you felt three pulses, you're going to be at the end of that transit. And you should quickly look to the left to right to see what was there. 
And it was a U.S. Supreme Court building underwater. I mean, I was in, it was like diving on, on a, a marine ruin. Washington, D.C.? Yes. Yeah, so and they confirmed that later, that it was that building. Was it? They confirmed the date and the building. Not when we were being interviewed by the officer from, you know, for the lieutenant commander from the Office of Naval Intelligence, but the next week in the learning lab, we said, what was that building and what year was it? And they so kind of sheepishly admitted that. It's very important for our uh, audience and the tape. Uh, uh, from zero to 100 percent, what's the percentage you would say that this event, this time travel you did, uh, will signify the actual event? I, don't, I wouldn't put it in ratios because we're living a, a, a cosmic, you know, quantum hologram that it has virtually an infinite set of adjacent timelines that are very close and internested. For example, if you move into another timeline, you often don't detect it because you're now just wherever you are, right? So I think the chances are zero or one. I would look at it more in a binary way. Either those of us in this room right now are going to live a 2013 that's very wet, <laughs> or we're not. So I, I think that you should look at it as being in the timeline where that either occurs or doesn't occur, because in fact, the probability can't even be calculated because there's an infinite set of timelines where it either does or doesn't happen. What you say is so many different Earths, and Earths, planets, and different, so many different people in different timelines at the same time exist. Yes, and we have evidence of people stepping out of their timeline. There was that case in New York City where somebody stepped in front of a cab and was killed, and he had clothing, identity, and everything else from, like, the 1940s. He just simply stepped out on a curb in 1943 and got hit by a car in 1983. We have those cases. And those, those X-Files have been studied, and they are people who literally step into an adjacent timeline just doing some kind of ordinary type of activity. Steve? What is the current status of Of what? Courtney Hunt. Courtney Hunt had a stroke in 2001 when he, in which he lost the ability to speak, and he's now deceased. But I want to get a picture of him and, and interview his colleagues. The person who confirmed that he wasn't just somebody snowing me, but in fact was, you know, in other words, if he was part of some cult or mind control group or something, everything that happened with Hunt could have been propagated by, let's say, virtual technology or something like the trip to, you know, to El Segundo and going to Mars and everything. But the person who confirmed his status as a career CIA was Captain Ernest Garcia, who even remembered me and some of the project principals from Pegasus. He remembered my dad's friend, Connie Chavez, from Albuquerque. So we were able to, in my investigation, I was able to verify that Courtney Hunt was career CIA, as he said he was. Therefore, what is the status of Captain Garcia? Uh, Captain Ernest Garcia is alive, living in Albuquerque. He did an oral history about some of his more conventional experiences working for the military and the intel community in an oral history that Jean Marie Arrigo did for UC Berkeley. Um, his fingerprints are over many projects. He was not only on Pegasus, but he was a guard on the Dead Sea Scroll expedition of the Israeli archaeologist Egal Yadin. He was the whistleblower on the use of the Yanomamo Indians in Central America in U.S. biowarfare testing. So Garcia is somebody with some pro provenance. He was giving me a lot of information, then he got scared, you know, and that's kind of how these kind of investigations go. Somebody will do two or three phone calls, maybe meet you at a restaurant at some point, and then they get afraid of being killed and they clam up. So I lost Garcia as a source, but I have a substantial amount of information that I was able to verify with him. And, and his status as somebody who was in a lot of these classified defense projects is actually has been basically established in terms of university history. You know, in other words, the, the conventional history community has knows who Garcia is and people have you know, done oral histories with him and so forth. Right here. Um, who invented or created the technology, or where did it come from? The teleporter, as my dad said when, I, when we were talking one day at lunch in Albuquerque after we had teleported there, he said, most of what we're doing in the project comes from the works of Nikola Tesla. The device was in the papers of Tesla that were seized by the War Department and forwarded to the Los Alamos physicists when they were gathering to build the atomic bomb. So the true history of U.S. time travel is sort of as the secret sidebar to the Manhattan Project. Some of the same people were involved, like Harold Agnew, like his mentor at the University of Chicago, Enrico Fermi. Um, the chronovisor technology was the result of an accidental discovery by two Vatican musicologists named Ernetti and Gemelli, who were studying Gregorian chants in the 1940s and were developing a specialized microphone to split the voices in the Gregorian chants 
when something Jamelli's father had said to him in childhood came through the microphone. And then they, they partnered with Enrico Fermi again. There's the principal figure in all this. So we're going to have to do more investigation on Enrico Fermi. And uh, they, they modeled it into a hologram of a past or future event by the time I was brought into the project in the late 60s. So the first time, the first time I saw a past event was that, that two-dimensional image of the signing of the U.S. Constitution at a national security watch post in Flemington, New Jersey. But certainly by the time I was on the project in 69-70, they were already propagating holograms of past events. So um, that was, it was an accidental discovery. Right here? Um, your father was uh, also working with the looking glass. Uh, my father, we, we know, and I was confirmed tr through that university historian who was my channel to the intel community, that my dad was essentially the dollar a year man on teleportation the theory and practice of teleportation, which, for which the Ralph M. Parsons Company was, was the primary defense contractor. In fact, I, I don't think I mentioned on Coast that, I may have, but that in 1972, right after Pegasus achieved all this quantum access stuff, and it was already operational, Ralph M. Parsons himself bought what was then the world's largest private yacht from the Iranian arms merchant Adnan Khashoggi and renamed it Pegasus II. And that, that was not still, that, I think that, that may still be on the Parsons website. So go, you know, go figure what, you know. Uh, Mr. Von Shagoff to deliver the lecture hall. Oh, okay. And, uh, oh, okay. What I suggest, uh, uh, if, if is possibility, then maybe we bring you again in Los Angeles before March or March 20th to come back. I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Th thank you.